And we're very, very lucky to have three faith leaders here today. Um, I'm not going to introduce them just yet. We are very lucky to be part of a theater climate action project that's happening all over the world, actually. And so we're going to begin, and then I'll introduce our, our speakers. Uh, we're going to begin with a sh very short play um, on the climate change theme called Earth Duet by E.M. Lewis. And we have two of our very own actors from Stanford who are going to do act it out. And I am going to just grab them in front of them. So, and for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm saying, just so this is a uh, sustainability study program event. Uh, we have a big program. Welcome to everyone for coming. We have a big program with five majors. Six minors, graduate certificate in GIS, really great program. Um, very happy to be on this one of your campus. I'm Heidi Hutner, I'm the director of the program. And at the suggestion of one of our wonderful faculty member members, Dr. Quigley, uh, he suggests doing an event on faith and climate. So at his suggestion, I began pursuing this last spring, and we're really, really happy to have this event and have many others. Things this fall already. We have a big event on fracking and fossil fuels, a huge event a few weeks ago. Um, so we're, we have, I can't remember what we had before that. It's another great event. So I want to introduce our two actors who are going to come up um, Ariane Shapiro and Tim Frenzel. And they're going to do a piece for you called Earth Duet by E.M. Lewis. Do we think the time can change? If some other time? 
for now? Do we care about the world we live in? Do we want to be around tomorrow? And tomorrow? And tomorrow after that? After we come and go? After our children come and go? After their children come and go? If we even have children. It's not about our children. It's about all children. Having a world tomorrow. We have the power to make that happen. How? Change the way we work upon the world. Let's change the way we work upon the world. Let's institute some long term thinking. Let's take care of what we've got. Let's be good stewards of the earth. Of this beautiful earth. Sweet blue planet Earth. Right now, it's the only one we've got. Besides, he's not telling you what's 
so much, but so often we hear in the Catholic Church a hierarchy of someone telling you what to do, or telling you what's right or wrong. No, he's not doing that in here. He does say some things that are wrong, actually. But he's telling you to dialogue. He's calling you to dialogue. And not only to, in this country, but globally. He's calling the whole global community to dialogue. And that is what we need. We know about conflict. We know that the global community knows a lot about conflict. A lot about differences. But very little about dialogue, about how to dialogue. And so this hope, that's another thing to say. And of course, I'm presuming that you know that he says that he believes in the science. He believes in the consensus of scientists. Because the Catholic Church is not opposed to science, it never was, and never will be. Because science like religion, is searching for the truth. And in our time, I believe, what's happening is that science and spirituality are coming together. And that's a powerful combination. And so we're not at odds with science. And we can bring something to science from a religious perspective. But the Pope believes the science. He believes that climate change is happening, and he also believes that humans are mainly the cause of it. Another piece of understanding this encyclical, coming from the Catholic Church, is that he calls the ecology integral ecology, which is, again, very important. Because he says we are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. It's one crisis. And in order to solve it naturally, we need to address both. And in the social, he pays a particular attention to those who are without, to those who are without resources, without money, without homes, without food. <coughs> this is another stream, this is not new in the Catholic Church. It has been a part of our social teaching for many, many years, and of course, going back to the Gospel of Jesus, who never excluded anyone, and notice who he hung around with. The poor. He was with the poor often because it was there and it is there where we can discover the truth. If we want to know the truth about the United States of America, go to the poor neighborhoods and we will discover perhaps who we are. So he he wants us to look at that too. And to discover in this combination that the economy that we have, capitalism, is a big part of the problem. And for us, living in this country, that may not be such good news. For the poor people, living in Bangladesh or, you know, Salvador or wherever, it, that may be good news. And so the gospel we say is good news. It may be a challenge for us, and this document, Laudate Si, is very challenging to the United States. He, the Pope does not mention the United States, but he talks about capitalism and consumerism a lot, and that, if we know, is related to us. And so, to solve the climate problem, we need to have a new understanding of progress. And progress does not always mean 
getting more, growing, 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 growing. Because as we know, we would probably need ten, uh, nine planets to live the way we're living, really. And that's why we're destroying so much of it. And so, we need to look at that for ourselves. Um, and so this is a grave ethical responsibility. And when profit is the main motive, terrible things can happen. And I think today, particularly of Exxon, because I've recently, I don't know if all of you have read about it, um, where Exxon knew in 1978, they had, they had hired actually their scientists were given the job of looking into climate change and seeing if it was happening and if it was humans caused, humanly caused. And they found out it was in 1978. Imagine if they had told us that then, if Exxon had told the truth. Where would we be now? That's what I ask. Would so many devastating places still be devastating? And instead of telling the truth, they decided to lie. They decided it was not profitable to tell the truth. And not only did they not tell the truth, that not only were they silent, not silent, just silent, which would be one thing, but they spent money to tell the untruth to make it seem as if it was not known. And, and then the whole thing, we know that we're, where we've been through for so many years now. And this is a religious question. This is a, this is a question for the, for the mosques, for the synagogues, for the churches. We talk about telling the truth. And we should not be accepting these lies, and we should be calling to accountability for future generations. Many of you may not know what I do, but I founded an organic farm here on Long Island at Amityville. It's called Homecoming Farm. So because I felt 20 years ago that's when we found it on Coming Farm, that people needed to come home to the earth. And that's what the Pope is talking about, too. He's talking about our common home. And this language is very important because it is our home. Part of the problem in the churches and part of our part in the destruction was that we were always focused, we were saying, this is not our true home, we're always going somewhere else. And not that there is no afterlife, I'm not saying that. But I'm not sure what it looks like. I know it's related to the universe, and that everything dies into the universe. So I know it's not a place apart, exactly, when you understand the cosmic reality which is really where we are today, in this evolutionary understanding of who we are. And so this is our home. This is our real home. If, imagine if we, instead of talking about going somewhere else and waiting for the time when we'll be redeemed out of here, imagine if we tried to create heaven on earth. What would the difference be if we thought it was possible? I think that might help with climate change. If we could think and believe that we could create a mutually enhancing place where the human and the natural world would live together in, in harmony. That's what Homecoming Farm was founded for, to do that. 
The Catholic Church has in its root incarnation, a belief that God became human, that God became flesh. And therefore, divinity is in the flesh. You know, we strayed very hard, far away from that in many periods of the church. But in understanding that the human and the flesh are divine, are holy. And if you, then if you take it further and understand as that photo was telling us, that this earth that we're in is also holy. It is flesh. It is alive. It's not an object. And we are part of it. We're part of the earth. Our body, in the, in the encyclical, it talks about this, our body contains the elements of the stars. Because if we understand evolution, we come out of the earth. And that is holy. That is sacred. The trees are sacred. At Homecoming Farm, we teach the children about the worms and the microbes who are part of the community that we're killing off. And they're part of our life. When we kill them off, we die. And they're holy, they're sacred. And so this sacramental understanding of the Catholic Church needs to be expanded like that. And to understand ourselves as cosmic people. There's not just so much I can say in 15 minutes, but I, I do, what I want to do is dialogue with you. That's what, and what, that's what I would prefer to do to hear what you think, because all of you are important. And you're not consumers. You're not objects for people to sell things to. You are part of the universe. You are sacred. And we're all related, no matter what our differences. I just want to share a poem which perhaps can say so much, and then later perhaps we can talk about things. But it's just a, a brief, a, a portion of a poem written by Wendell Berry, who's a, a poet, still farming in Kentucky, uh, an essayist who is a, really a, quite a, a critic of the United States and our culture. If we would have the wisdom to survive, to stand like slow growing trees on a ruined place. If we would make our seasons welcome here, asking not too much of earth or heaven, and a long time after we are dead, the lives our lives prepare will live here. Imagine if we saw that as our identity. Imagine if we saw that as our work. Homecoming Forum was really founded on the teachings of Thomas Berry, a passionist priest who died about five years ago, who wrote the book, The Great Work. It's all of our work. To live lives preparing the place where others will live a fuller life because of the way we live. So thank you so much.
not, um, I'm a lay person. I'm a grassroots activist and my sister or a rabbi and my Hindu priest and somebody, a human being that cares about justice, um, like every one of you in this room. My work uh, for almost three decades has been in the grassroots women's movement. And 15 years ago, I co-founded an organization called Women for Afghan Women, um, which grew from being a very tiny volunteer-run effort right here in New York City to becoming the largest frontline women's organization in Afghanistan. And um, it has been awe-inspiring to see what people of faith, because our organization is 700 strong and everybody is a justice embracing Muslim, but people of faith can do when they take on from their heart and with their bodies social justice issues. Um, so that's my work. And four years ago, I was with my organization, Women for Afghan Women, we have a center in Queens, and I was at a place um, close to ground zero with a group of Muslim women at that time, some of you will remember, there was an effort to build what was incorrectly called the Ground Zero Mosque, Part 51. It was going to be a, an Islamic cultural center, um, community center, close to Ground Zero, to heal us, heal the city, heal the world from the heinous attack that was perpetrated by a mis- in, in, in the name of Islam, but a misinterpretation of Islam. And I was there with women from the Afghan community there um, in, a, in a vigil and a rally in support of Part 51. Now, I'm Hindu. I was born Hindu. Um, this is an accident of fate. My parents, my family are devout Hindus, but very liberal. And um, I grew up with this dual identity. I was Hindu at home and a women's rights activist in my work. And this is four years ago. I'm 47 now. So at age 43, I hadn't pieced that together. But that day, it began, this journey, this new journey began, because I was with my Muslim sisters in a vigil in support of an Islamic cultural center, and I suddenly heard a sound. And in my mind, it sounded familiar. I looked around me, and the vigil I was a part of was interfaith, and many of you for my age and older know that whenever there are interfaith social justice events in our area, only recently have Hindus started to participate. And, um, and, and so I, you know, I, I wasn't even expecting to see Hindus on, on my side of this vigil. But when I heard the sound and it sounded familiar, I looked across and there was a counter rally, a protest of Part 51. And while there were no Hindus standing with me, and I saw dressed in saffron, a man and a woman on the other side, among the people who believed that because the attack on 9-11 was perpetrated in the name of Islam, to act to have an Islamic center so close to ground zero would dishonor the lives that were taken that day. The, the Islamophobia that was manifest in the name of my religion, combined with the pain of the sisters I was with, were who whose religion that they embraced and adored did, did not justify, did not, was not represented by 9-11. That moment gave birth to me as a Hindu. I came out as a Hindu. I said, no, that's not the Hinduism I was raised with. And I know that in Christianity and Judaism, in Islam, I knew personally people who said not in my name, but I didn't know at that time Hindus that said not in my name. And over my lifetime, the right wing of Hinduism has grown strong, and I saw them with my own eyes that day, and I said, not in my name. So that led to, that moment crystallized for me what I had to do to speak about social justice as a Hindu. And it was easy. Once I made the decision, once I embodied that, once I brought it together, it was easy. Um, we created, among the friends who felt the same way, we created an organization four years old now because it was born soon after that moment, and we call ourselves Savana. Savana means faith in action, and so we're, we are progressive Hindus who wish to live and live out the social justice principles of the religion we were brought, or brought born into, which is Hinduism. So we are called Savana Coalition of Progressive Hindus, and just saying it, just calling ourselves 
Hindus was in fact radical in our Hindu community because there are not many organizations that are calling out for social justice principles within the Hindu community. And those that are tend to be talking about the rights and the justice issues of the Hindus. But we go, we were raised with teachings deep from deep within the faith. And so what Sister was talking about, what the Pope is talking about, is these are the lessons we were raised with, which is that we are one. And if you hurt one person, you have hurt the universe. This is something that we knew deep in our hearts because of the way our parents raised us. But why wasn't why were there not Hindu leaders speaking this teaching in the name of atrocities were that were taking place in the world? We didn't know and we couldn't wait any longer. And, and so we, we would just speak it out ourselves. And we talked about the, te the teachings that we have deeply, deeply drunk our whole lives and which guide us in our work on this earth. They include a <coughs> Ahimsa is non-violence, non-violence to each other, but also non-violence to this universe, to the water, the earth, air. And we, as children, we read the Ramayana, which is one of our epics in Hinduism. And Ramayana begins with Sage Valmiki, the author of the Ramayana, walking by a beautiful river, crystal clear river. And he sees, and he's praying, he's doing his morning ablutions, and he's praying and he sees two curlews, which are wading birds, mating. And a hunter shoots one of them. And then he hears his prayer is disturbed by the piercing, grief-stricken cry of the, woman, the female curlew, whose mate has just been killed. And Valmiki goes into a deep depression and grief. He comes back to his hut. And he is in, he's in stasis, he's in paralysis, his grief has paralyzed him. And Lord Brahma comes to his hut and says to Sage Valmiki, you must transform your soka, which is grief, into shloka, which is verse. And that's when he starts to utter the verse, which is the Ramayana. And so this text that is so dear to us as Hindus was born out of grief and pain at the destruction of life on this earth, and that is transformed into the teachings of the Ramayana, and all of our scriptures teach us about oneness, about protecting the universe, about caring for life. Ekatva, which is oneness. There is the saying, Tattvam Asi, which is that thou art, which in essence is we are one. I am that, I am Brahman, I am the divine. The divine is not above me, it's in me. It is in every single cell, in every single thing, every piece of creation, the stars. We are part of that, that is part of us. Tattvam Asi. Dharma, this is another, you know, the Bhagavad Gita is a Hindu text which is very, very beloved to all Hindus. And um, Arjuna, this is part of the Mahabharata, another Hindu epic. Arjuna is, again, just like Valmiki, paralyzed, doesn't know what to do, because he is called upon to lead an army to war. Now, the people on the other side, the, the, other, the other army, the opponents, are his cousins and brethren. He does not want to lift up arms against his family, his kin, and he just puts down his arms and slumps to the ground. And Lord Krishna, the whole of the Bhagavad Gita is Lord Krishna's counsel to Arjuna, and it's a call to action. And in that small little volume is encompassed all the teachings um, of Hinduism, of Advaita philosophy, of oneness, non-dualism. That this, this teaching of Tattvam Asi is non-dualism. It is a heart and soul of Hinduism. And that teaching is given by Krishna to Arjuna in this book, and it is a call to action. It isn't that Krishna is supposed, is Arjuna is supposed to ponder these words of this philosophy. He is to, to drink in that philosophy and get up and do his thing, which is righteous duty. These are the teachings that we grew up with, and these are the teachings which ought to move us to right action. Dharma on this planet right now is to address the crisis in the climate change. Dharma today is to address the divisions between us as people, as peoples of faith, women in a 
in terms of the Hindu community, the atrocities that are perpetrated against Muslims in India, Christians in India, and Dalits, the people of the lowest class. It is, it, it is incumbent upon Hindus to learn from these teachings and act today because it is a crisis. We in Sadhana, we call ourselves Sadhana because we don't want to just ponder and pray. We want to act. The call to action has reached our ears and we are we are mobilized. And so Sadhana wanted to have a, a grassroots project, in, you know, that, so that we're not just talking, we're doing. Our grassroots project is called Project Prithvi. Prithvi is Earth, Mother Earth. And um, what we do, we live in New York, so what we do is every month we go to Jamaica Bay. And if you come with me, and in fact, the next speech, is I'm going to tell you about our beach cleanups. The next one is this coming Saturday. <coughs> come with us. It's the last one for the year and we start up again in the spring. We go every month to temples in the Hindu community and we speak to the priests and we speak to the devotees and we uh, make the pretty obvious um, statement that since the water and since the earth and since the air is divine to us, it is a contradiction, an unacceptable contradiction to pollute the water and the air and the earth. What happens at the bodies of water, I'm sure you all know, is the same in India, and it's famously true that the river Ganga, which is the holiest river to us, the river Yamuna, in fact, all the rivers of India um, are very, very, very dangerously polluted through worship practices where people put their offerings into the water, but also everything that the Pope is talking about, this, um, this economy, profit-driven business culture that we all live in which creates devastating, devastating pollution. Our rivers in India are suffering. And if only the prayer with which we go to the riverside could lead us to just connect it to the consequence of, our, of the way that we live our lives and worship, this would be such a different world. So what we do, we go to the temples, we, bring, we mobilize devotees and the priests support us in this, and we come out once a month to Jamaica Bay and the devotees, the volunteers that come out with us, they, they look at the beach and strewn across the beaches in Jamaica Bay, of course, is garbage from, you know, left by all the people that use the beach, fisher people, just regular people like you and me. But, but entangled in that garbage, you will find the offerings of new devotees because they put their offerings, the Hindu puja, which is worship, they put their offerings into the water and it's everything. It's the tray, which is made of steel, it's styrofoam cups, it's sar entire saris, it's uh, containers of joysticks, other buttons, it's key containers, and it's fruit, flour, flowers, um, coconuts. All of that is put into the water with the most devout prayers and yearnings. Pure hearts of people have, have prayed into those offerings into the water, but then it washes back up and gets entangled with everything from beer bottles to used condoms to um, you know, any, any, anything and everything you can imagine. And so when I see the devotees come out to the beach on Saturday morning, I see pain. I, see, I recognize the pain that I felt the day that I saw the Hindu arguing, protesting against Part 51. I see that pain. And the pain that you see a broken Ganesha face down in the dirt. And that devotee, you don't need to tell them anything. It is that pain. It is when they recognize that the, the way that we are living is devastating this earth. When that recognition happens inside a person, the people see the transformation. And so I see volunteers getting up, picking up the garbage, as if it is prayer, because it is. In Hinduism, karma yoga, which is action, service, is a very equal and legitimate form of worship to devotion and prayer and to pursuit of knowledge. Those are the three very equal and equal paths to God. And they will pick up the garbage in a devout way. And it is miraculous to encounter this with my eyes. So Pope Francis in Pope, I, okay, uh, Pope Francis in his in, in his encyclical to me sounds like a Hindu. He talks about all of us on this planet doing our karma for each other and our Mother Earth. He talks about how environmental justice is our moral responsibility. 
and protection, protecting creation and protecting the poor and, and disenfranchised are inter, in, they're indivisible, they're interconnected. And we are part of creation. And he talks about the throwaway culture, the consumer culture. In Hinduism, we talk about the obstacles to living a good life, to doing our dharma, and attaining God and true knowledge. And those are ahankara, lobha, avidya, dresa. These are pride, a, a false self, a self sense of yourself, greed, ignorance, and hatred. This is what the Pope is talking about. Um, maybe when I come around, I'll stop.
So it is that love and yet that humility that is essential for us to begin in terms of our spiritual approach to this issue. The second characteristic of environmentalism is, we mentioned, long-term thinking. We live in a world, we're all part of it, where we are tweeting from minute to minute, we're looking at the stock exchange minute to minute, we are looking at things minute to minute, maybe day to day, but we have to think about the future. In the Jewish community, we often uh, speak about the door by door, from generation to generation. And we're not just talking about the past, we are talking about how what we do today will have an impact on future generations. The carbon that we are emitting at this very moment by the use of our microphones and our lights and everything like that will remain in the atmosphere for between 100 and 1,000 years. And it is that impact on future generations, not only of human beings, but of all life on this planet, that should impel us to try and do something about it. The third characteristic is the notion of interconnection. This is both a scientific fact and a spiritual understanding, which we have heard some other traditions, and my tradition feels the same way. And I'll see it on two different levels, which Pope Francis actually deals with. One is the status of the human being, and the other is the relationship of the human being to the rest of creation. The, the Jewish tradition and the other Abrahamic faiths of Christianity and Islam talk about humans being created in the image of God. That comes from in the Hebrew Bible in Genesis 1. Now, whatever the original meaning of that, there is an ethical, there is an ethical uh, consequence to believing that. That if all human beings are created in the age of God, that no human being can, can say they are superior to another human being, and it forces us to treat all human beings with equity. <clears throat> if I meet you and I see you as an image of God, how can I mistreat you? That is a sense of human interconnection. But there's also a sense of interconnection with the rest of creation. This is beautifully expressed in the Hebrew Bible in Psalm 148 which was probably a piece of liturgy from the ancient temple in Jerusalem, in which all of creation, all the heavens, all the earthly creatures, the landscape, even the weather itself, are joined together as a community choir, a creation choir, all together praising uh, God. And humans do not have a pride of place in that text. So in a certain sense, we are scientifically interconnected through everything that goes on in this world, and has mentioned that we all trace ourselves back to the Big Bang, that we all, all the substance of the universe came from a single source, but also it's a spiritual and moral sense of interconnection. And this is where we fail today, because the way we operate today, there is a, a moral gap between our actions and the consequences. What I'm doing here is having, in this time, an impact on people on the other side of the world who I've never met and will never meet, and yet, what I do is having an impact on them. This was, came home to me over 10 years ago when I was on a panel at an NGO conference of the United Nations sponsored by the Baha'i community, and the Baha'is have been very active on this issue for many years internationally. And I was asked to give the religious perspective on the moral implications of climate change more than 10 years ago. One of the other people on the panel was the former UN ambassador from the island of Tuvalu from the South Pacific. And I'm sure many of you have heard of Tuvalu, maybe you haven't. But it's one of those South Pacific islands that within the next couple decade or so will disappear because of rising sea levels. And over 10 years ago when he spoke, he said it had risen enough they could not have to meet water anymore. They had to import their water. They couldn't grow their food anymore. Now the people on Tuvalu have lived there for 3,000 years. They are their own culture and language. And no country will take them in as a group. So the Tuvalu people as a people will ultimately probably disappear. And that's just one example. But interconnectedness I mentioned before is also generations in the future. So how do we bridge that ethical gap between our actions and their consequences? 
This is the challenge that all of us in the modern world must face. And we have to do it by creating empathy with others. And we do it through, we can actually use the tools of technology to do that, but we also have to meet face to face like this. And I think that an interfaith group is more powerful than when we seek these alone. I mean, it's important to do work in your own community, but it's vitally important that we come together and work together. Because we all have our own language, our own sources, our own text, and they're wonderful and they're beautiful. Um, and that's great. But this is a universal human crisis. And one we must act in a universal way. I want to mention one, uh, a couple of other things. One of the critical elements in my tradition is the concept of what's called in Hebrew tzedek, which means justice or righteousness, but has a core meaning of equity. Now, there are two kinds of justice. There's distributive justice, where you believe that it is important that basically everyone have equal access to the fruits of creation, but also deal with the results of how we utilize creation. In other words, we should be equally sharing both the risks and the benefits. And we are not. That's where Pope Francis' encyclical is really a call to action because the poor are the ones who've enjoyed the least fruits of the fossil fuel economy and will suffer the majority of its results and have the fewest resources to deal with it. That is a breaking in my tradition of Sedek. And when you look in the law codes in Exodus or Leviticus or Deuteronomy, when you look at the call of the prophets, they are calling for societies to live as much as possible with Sedek. And if you don't, you have no right to the land on which you live. So that's really critical. Another aspect of justice, which is a little more modern, um, is really what's called participatory justice. That the people who are most impacted by this should have the most say. And what we see in the world today is so many people whose voices are not being heard. And what I think Pope Francis was trying to do is to raise up those voices. You're going to see it when the Paris talks begin. There are tens of thousands of people of all faith who've gone on pilgrimages from all around Europe and are arriving in Paris the night before the talks to demand, to raise their voices, to demand that the politicians and diplomats hear the voices of the earth. I'm part of a group called Green Faith, which is an interfaith group. We are part of an international campaign called Our Voices, which is precisely what, what we are trying to do. There is somebody that we are sponsor, been sponsoring a former diplomat of uh, the Philippine government uh, named Yev Sanyo, and he has been walking from Rome to Paris to coincide with the talk as a what's called a people's pilgrimage. He just crossed the Alps yesterday or the day before. You can follow him on Facebook or Twitter. And the people's pilgrimage is meant to bring everybody to this realization. And there is a web page called the People's Pilgrimage. And if you go there, you can do a local pilgrimage by yourself or with a group, doesn't matter where. And you register it and you will appear on a global map as you show solidarity for the people who are coming from England, from Scandinavia, from Germany, from France, and from Italy, or from <coughs> uh, to Paris. So this is something that we can all participate to raise our voices like the ancient prophets and say, we must have our voices heard. We demand that there be setting equality and justice in the world. We often know about the deprecations. And one of the things that I think the religious environment movement does is it can bring a sense of hope. And, 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 I, and I really feel that that's important. Because if I didn't have hope, if I didn't believe that what I do today could change things for the better for my grandchildren's future, why should I be involved in this? And look, there's a lot of people who have a kind of nihilistic view and say, well, nothing we can do is going to matter, so 
so we should just live the way we want because, you know, it's all going to hell in a handbasket after all anyway. Well, my tradition is essentially optimistic. It says that the future can be better than the present. And this is expressed in a concept that has been uh, developed in modern Jewish uh, social justice ideology called tikkun olam. It's an old term, but it's a mo the way it's used is quite modern. And it means the healing or fixing of the world. That we can, that it is our moral responsibility to fix what we have broken. And that God will not come down and pull us out of the fire. It is our duty to do that. Tikkun olam is something that we can all participate in. And I want to leave you with, uh, I should have brought a picture of it. Um, in Israel, there's an environmental institute in the Negev called the Arapah Institute that brings together not just Israelis, but Palestinians and other people to learn about desert ecology and also about environmentalism. And there's a plant biologist there named Dr. Elaine Solway who was given about five years ago, maybe more, some ancient seeds that were found in the archaeological site of Masada. They were 2,000-year-old seeds. And she, one of her areas of expertise is to try and understand how long will seeds remain fertile if they're stored. This is really important for the future of agriculture. And she germinated one of those seeds. And it has grown into a palm tree. They call it the Methuselah tree. It was germinated from a 2,000-year-old seed. It is an extinct species of date palm that existed 2,000 years ago in Judea when Judea was known for the sweetness of its dates. For those of you who are Christians, Jesus made dates from a tree like that. And that to me is a symbol of Tikkun Olam, that a 2,000-year-old seed of an extinct species can be brought back to life by human ingenuity and the will fix the world. Let it be for us a symbol of hope and what in our tradition we call the Eitz Chaimim, the tree of life that are the teachings of God. Thank you. I think they can be shown 
And some of them are going to speak in a much more traditional way, okay, and, 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 and not as expansive as I do. But I think even within that, they can be shown that humans have an incredible responsibility to be good stewards of the earth. At least, and, and, and I know Orthodox people, even I, there are even people who are extremely Orthodox who are interested in doing that. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's uh, a lost cause. And so um, she says, and I'm just wondering if 
reactions might be from the three of you. She says that people that um, are denying climate change, really what they're denying is they don't find acceptable solutions. They're, they're, there's the solutions that have been offered by the environmentalists so far, um, there are so many downsides to them, and, and uh, sometimes they're villainized. They're villainizing people. And so people are objecting to the solutions. And so instead of coming up with an alternative solution, it's easier to attack the problem. And that's where this whole um, creating doubt has, has come about with the fossil fuel industry and whatnot. Um, so what do you, I'd like to hear just, um, some solutions from your, from your faiths that maybe people in your faith traditions could accept or be um, more open to um, that might uh, provide hope as opposed to saying, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, um, you know, it's an apocalyptic problem that we can't solve. Well, I, I think that solutions have to be on different levels. Um, there's the individual level. Um, how we live our lives, how we deal with our consumption, um, energy use, I mean, and there's all kinds of ways of analyzing that, the food that we eat, all that sort of stuff, and that's important. Then there is our community level, and one of the things that Green Faith has tried to see is that religious community can be powerful engines of change. They not only can change themselves as a group, but will also influence the individual members and also reach beyond their community. And so that's, both those things are essential and important. But I will say, at the moment, the criti we are at a critical moment. We have to think globally. We have to talk to our politicians. Even when they have publicly denied climate change, we should not let them get away with it. Okay? We need to talk to them respectfully. But we need to say, what are you going to do? And that's why all this thing is happening in Paris, because there's a tremendous fear that it's going to end up with a treaty that really will not solve the problem. I mean, Kyoto was a complete failure, and we, can't, we don't have the time to do that again. So I think what's really important is for everybody to really raise their voices at this point, um, to say we want this country to sign a good, strong treaty. And yeah, I mean, you know, we've got Congress that doesn't want to act at all. But, so I'm not expecting a miracle overnight, but we have to keep at it day after day, and the next flashpoint for the American religious environmental movement and the environmental movement in general is the, is the American elections. We have to go after every candidate and say, what is your stance on this? And make them publicly declare where they are. That's critical. The other question, yeah, Jennifer. Yeah, I Thank you. 
the governmental part right now is very important because globally that power needs to shift and we have to let go uh, a lot and I think what Ashley said about the denial you know there is that, that element that because of the solutions but there's a big element of the fossil fuel industry is supporting the people who say they don't believe I'm not sure they don't believe I think there are some of them
It's an opportunity to do it um, while you're still in school. It's right on your resume. There's a person right here from the, the clinic group that's looking for internships right on Long Island, looking for students. Um, this garden, is, this farm is right on Long Island. I'm sure you can find There's flyers over here. I'm sure there are green faith activities in both of your groups. But that some of you live in the city, so your location is even better for them on the weekends or whatever. So I encourage you, or come to us and ask if you don't know, we'll be happy to put you in touch. Um, these are really, really wonderful suggestions, and we're very much about that in the program, that you actually do things, you don't just learn about it. Yeah. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say, uh, express my gratitude to the guests for coming and sharing these uh, very thought-provoking feelings, uh, and to thank you, uh, Professor Hutner, for organizing this. So th thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, you know, we, there, there are so many opportunities to do the things that all three of you are talking about, so please come to us, ask. If you're not a leader, come to us and ask. You can still get involved and do, do these projects. In our program, we do a lot of it for the People's Climate March. We went to a number of tar sands marches. We've been struggling with this idea of getting an organic farm on this for a while, but it's still there and happening in a different way. So all of these things. And I, I, want, I hope we can 